it. Uh, thank you for joining for this pre-construction information session. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start off with some housekeeping um, regarding the WebEx functionality and then um, get on with the presentation. Um, so to begin, um, we'll go through some of the basic controls to help you participate in this platform. Uh, please note that this is an open meeting and as required by DC code, it's being recorded and the recording will be made available to the public. Um, the video file will be shared on the on the project website and also on DDOT's YouTube channel uh, within seven days after the meeting has ended. This meeting is also being live streamed to DDOT's Facebook page. So if you're having any issues with the website, you can um, move over to the Facebook page. And, um, and then uh, as we move through the meeting, you can enter questions and comments in the Q&A as we move along. And uh, we may respond to them right in the Q&A. Um, we have people on the team watching it that could interrupt me so that, uh, you know, if it's a point of clarification, but for the most part, the Q&A will be at the end. Um, if you're having any difficulty with the uh, WebEx and you need technical support during this meeting, uh, you can call 202-997-8354. And we have uh, a lovely staff member that can help you uh, fix any issues you might be having. Um, note that uh, everyone is on mute during this meeting. Uh, you cannot unmute yourself just to help the meeting run smoothly and make sure there's no auditory disruptions during the presentation. Um, this meeting does have closed captions available through an automatic system. Um, click the CC icon on the lower left corner of the window to turn on closed captions. There are additional settings, so you may adjust the appearance of the captions if needed. Uh, if you're using the WebEx mobile application, click on the three dots, scroll down and select the closed captions option and make sure the toggle switch is blue. Uh, in terms of video, your video camera is off by default and you will not be able to share video during this presentation. If you have a question during the presentation, like I said, send it via the Q&A feature. Uh, to send a question, click on the three dot icon in the bottom right side of the WebEx window and select Q&A. A, a new panel or window will appear in the ask field select all panelists, click in the text box to type your question and press the enter key to send it. If you joined via browser or mobile app, click Q&A or question mark icon to access the Q&A to ask a question. So to begin, I, I wanted to introduce some members of the team here at DDOT that have been working on this project over the years um, uh, who may also participate in the, the Q&A and, and help out with responding to some of the questions. Um, uh, Laura Medina is the transportation engineer who's uh, leading the design on the project. Brittany Adams is the engineering construction manager um, who will be managing the construction um, once we get started in July. Mike Goodnow is a transportation planner on our active transportation team, who's a, a bicycle program specialist. Um, and Jamie Carrington is, is my manager on the bus priority team. And Minyan Bowie is the community engagement specialist for Ward 1, um, is also on the line and may assist with um, responding to some of these things that go into the Q&A. So the agenda for this evening is we'll go through the project background, talk about how we got here, why we're doing this. Um, we also will provide a summary of, of what we've heard from the community on this project. And we'll talk about how we've been responsive to that some of that community feedback uh, through design refinements. Then we will uh, go through the construction schedule 
and then talk about what comes after the uh, the construction with the project evaluation and, and how we'll look at whether this has been a successful project and how we can make it better. So we'll start with the project background. Um, and so I want to take a little bit of time to go through um, some of the different activities that we did in support of each phase of the project. We start all of our projects with a needs assessment, which is where we go out with a blank slate and just want to ask people, you know, what are your problems? What are your issues? Um, you know, identifying in more detail uh, what it is that we're trying to solve for with this project. Um, and to do this, we attended monthly meetings of ANC1C at the Planning, Zoning, and Transportation Committee. We spoke to the Adams Morgan Partnership Business Improvement District uh, Board of Directors, hung posters at bus stops, handed out flyers to bus riders, uh, had the opportunity to table at the Adams Morgan Farmers Market and speak to some residents. Uh, we also handed out flyers to all the businesses on the corridor to, to see what um, we could learn about their loading needs and other uh, operational factors. Um, here pictured on the right is a flyer that we were using just to kind of solicit open-ended feedback. You know, what, what are your problems? Um, and then the next stage of, of all of our projects is the concept development, where we look at the problems that were identified during the needs assessment and start thinking about how we can solve them. Um, and so during this period, we um, att again attended the monthly meetings of the ANC, the Adams Morgan bid, uh, board of directors, uh, once again visited the Adams Morgan farmers market, um, attended the Adams Morgan vibe concert in Calorama Park, um, distributed flyers to all the residences, all the businesses along the corridor and uh, you know, described what is, the, what is it that we're proposing for this corridor um, to address the issues that we've heard. Um, we got a great response. We uh, put a, pr a presentation of the different concepts we looked at up on the website, on YouTube. We got over a thousand views and received a lot of feedback through that phase. Um, and then the next phase of the project is where we work on trying to refine the design. Uh, so we select a concept, we send a letter saying what it is that we're proposing to do. We did that in May 2023. And at that point, we start design and we start working with the community to see how we can um, make the concept better and see what refinements we can do. Um, we had a, a workshop with um, representatives from the business community and from uh, residents going through every block and talking about what would be an appropriate curbside regulation, um, every block within about 250 feet of Columbia Road. Um, and once again, uh, presented to the ANCs, uh, ANC 1C and 1A, neighboring ANC, and um, you know, sought feedback on on how we could improve the concept. And and at that point, through the the work that we had done over the prior years, we also had a good um, list of uh, email addresses to be able to reach out to to everybody who'd been engaged in the project throughout the whole process. Uh, then in February 2024, we took the final step of uh, public feedback. Uh, before construction and issued the notice of intent, um, ended up extending the comment period, got a lot of great feedback, about 200 comments were submitted. Um, and, um, you know, we've we've been able to, to respond to many of those. And during the same period, well, over about the past year, we've had 12,000 views on on our website. And so I think that we've We've been successful in, in communicating about this project to a lot of people. And so I think one of the, the key questions about this project is why is DDOT doing this project? And um, I just want to reiterate um, what we learned um, during the needs assessment and what were kind of the key findings. And one of the most frequent complaints was that the corridor is unsafe for walking or, or biking. And so, um, uh, a finding is that uh, there are unsafe conditions for vulnerable roadway users. And, and when I say vulnerable roadway users, I'm 
primarily referring to people biking, walking, or, um, and the reason they're called vulnerable is because they don't necessarily represent the majority of people in crashes, but they do represent the majority of the injuries that happen. So almost every time there's a police report of a, a person walking or biking um, that's in a crash, um, there is an injury. Um, and so Columbia Road is in our, our long range transportation plan as a priority for uh, bikes and also buses. Um, and, you know, it also has a history of residents demanding improvements um, in the safety. Um, in 2021 and 2022, ANC1C passed resolutions supporting protected bike lanes. There was a tragic fatal crash that occurred on the corridor in 2021. And, Hi, sorry, Kevin, I'm um, sorry to interrupt, but you I, I dropped off for just a second. So, um, oh. uh, sorry, you uh, could rewind yourself a bit. <laughs> Did you hear me talk about the long range transportation plan move DC? Oh, well, then maybe that's me. I apologize, everyone. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Good. Um, and so there was there was a uh, fatal crash in 2021. Um, police reports show that um, there's a pattern of injuries to pedestrians and cyclists on the corridor. And so from day one, even though this is a bus priority project, safety was going to be a key part of it. Um, anytime that DDOT is doing work on a corridor, uh, we try to improve the safety and, and that was going to be a key focus of this prop of this project from the very beginning. And another key part of this project, key part of the findings is that it has some of the slowest bus speeds in the district. Um, in the DDOT's bus priority plan, Columbia Road was the second slowest corridor in the district um, with average speeds of under six miles per hour. Another key finding is that uh, there is, and this is you know, probably not surprising to many of you, there is inadequate space for commercial loading um, we did observations measuring the length needed for the loading activities that happen. There's about 1,500 feet of loading and under 500 feet of loading zones. And so there's obviously a lot of things that are needed on Columbia Road. Un unfortunately, not everything can fit. Um, the existing roadway is 50 feet through most of the corridor. Um, to fit everything, it would it would need to be larger. and if that's not feasible, and I don't think it's what, what what people want either. The wide sidewalks are one of the things that people like the most, and the intimate feeling of the small businesses is one of the attractive things about the neighborhood. And so the proposed concept that was put forward by DDOT for this project was to, or that is being put forward by DDOT for this project is a protected bike lane through the whole corridor and a full-time center running bus lane northeast bound from 17th Street to Little Harvard is what we call it, close to 16th Street. And then we're fitting in parking, you know, every place we can and trying to be strategic about, about where we place it and, and how we fit in all these different elements and trying to put in uh, what's needed where it's needed. Um, we also are doing some major revisions to the curbside regulation between Belmont Street and 17th Street, which is the kind of core commercial area to try to shift the uses more toward, towards the, the short term uses and loading. Um, and then throughout this whole project, um, there's many different elements that are serving as traffic calming, and that's curb extensions, pedestrian refuge islands, protected bike lanes, and lane shifts to, to moderate speeds throughout the corridor and improve safety for, for all users. Another key element of the project and what will be one of the major parts of the construction effort is the, the bus stops. And so I wanna talk a little bit about the bus stop spacing. Um, the bus stop spacing is very important to DDOT, and this is something that we worked really hard on. Um, 
The stop spacing, of course, must balance easy access to bus stops with efficient service. And generally speaking, WMATA's bus stop guidelines calls for four or five bus stops per mile. So that, um, that translates to about 1,000 to 1,300 feet between the bus stops. Um, I'm going to talk about it momentarily, but WMATA, the who operates Metrobus, is in the process right now of overhauling their network. And part of that overhaul is going to mean bringing bus stops across the district into these into line with these uh, stop spacing guidelines. Um, and so what's what we're doing on Columbia Road is is what we do with all of our bus priority projects. And it's also something that's gonna be happening across the district as part of the uh, bus network redesign that WMATA is embarking on right now. And so the average stop spacing on the corridor is gonna increase from about 760 feet to about 1140 feet. And that will mean that there's a bus stop within a, a block and a half of anywhere on Columbia Road at the end of this project. I also wanted to talk a little bit about the bus stops. Um, it's important to have these constructed platforms when we do a protected bike lane to prevent people from parking in the bus stops and um, to make it so that buses don't have to pull into the protected bike lane. And so through the corridor, we're gonna be constructing these shared bus stops and bus stop islands. Um, pictured on the screen right now are a couple of examples of those bus stops. Um, on the right are shared bus stops on 11th Street, and on the left is a bus stop island on Minnesota Avenue Southeast. Uh, more information about these bus boarding platforms is available on the DDOT bus priority website. We've got a video about how to use them and the rationale for them and so forth. Um, I also wanted to note that um, after the, the main construction uh, happens on the corridor, DDOT will be following up to do the bus shelter relocations, benches, and installing real-time bus information hardware um, after the construction happens. It's done with a separate contract and it's coordinated with WMATA, so it just makes sense to do those two things separately. Uh, there will be a lag, but we are working on, on trying to move those amenities to the new stop locations as quickly as possible. And I wanted to go through some of the public feedback, some of what we've heard about this concept. Um, so starting with the needs assessment, I already talked about this a little bit, but we got a lot of really good, um, we had a lot of good conversations with people. People reached out, shared narratives of different crashes that they'd nearly had, um, stories about uh, what made them feel unsafe. Um, that, that was kind of the most common thing we were hearing about is that people feel unsafe biking um, due to parking violations, inadequate infrastructure, the way that the bike lanes are, don't run through the whole corridor, there's long gaps, um, and then also reckless driving. Um, people frequently said that protected bike lanes and improved crosswalks would, would make them feel safer. Then we also learned, uh, got a lot of public feedback once we put forward a concept um, that we proposed to, to address the issues that people had raised. Um, most people that, that contacted us about the project, it was pretty brief and they just said that they really like what's being proposed and they think that we should move ahead with it. Um, other feedback that we got on the project um, went into more detail and um, expressed opposition and would often cite reasons um, why they think that the, why the proposal is problematic. Um, people discuss the planning process, providing um, whether we were providing adequate connectivity for the bike facilities and how we connected public outreach. Other people talked about the parking impacts of the project relating to the scarcity of parking and um, ensuring that there would be access to destinations in the future. Uh, and then also about bus stops. People had concerns about the design of the bus stops and they also had concern about the inconvenience that would be imposed by the distance between bus stops. 
And then lastly, a lot of people had general concerns about the street design. Uh, people were concerned about the general roadway operations. And there was also a concern that this proposal would not improve safety for pedestrians. And that was one thing I, I really want to make clear is that this project is full of things that will uh, control speeding on the corridor, improve, and that improves yield compliance at unsignalized crosswalks. And it is, um, you know, been a proven measure to improve, like protected bike lanes and these different interventions are are proven strategies to improve safety for all roadway users. And we don't have time to, to go through all of the details of the, the feedback and the responses that DDOT has provided, but I wanted to direct people to the project website where we've put together a, a listing of uh, many of the, the common feedback and um, responses from DDOT. And I recommend going and taking a look at that. And I, I previously mentioned the uh, bus network redesign that WMATA is working on. WMATA, of course, is the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority um, who operates the buses through the corridor. Um, they are proposing these changes to service for 2025. Um, I included a little snippet of the map here so that you can see service on Columbia Road. Um, you can see that. <clears throat> um, you know, there are some changes to how the service is configured. Um, the service on Connecticut Avenue, the the L2 is is no longer going to make the connection over to Adams Morgan, um, but there is going to be a route that connects DuPont Circle to Petworth via Columbia Road um, and Columbia Heights. So that will be a new new bus route available to to folks on the corridor. Um, the D72 is pretty similar to the 4243, but with increased frequency and um, goes to a different destination downtown. And so I really encourage people to um, check out that website on the slide. And then I also wanted to note that they're having a discovery day and public hearing at the Columbia Heights Educational Campus next week, um, Thursday, June 20th, all afternoon, 3 to 7 p.m., and get your comments in by 5 p.m. July 5th, 15th, excuse me. So next I wanted to talk about some of the refinements to the design that we've made uh, over the years in response to public feedback that we've received. Um, public feedback has led to a lot of changes in, in how we're going about this project. Um, one of the major things that we heard from the business community is that we were proposing too many loading zones and i'll show this on a map momentarily but we've converted a lot of those to to metered parking zones they also encouraged us to look at some of the side streets that have commercial properties on them and consider making those into metered parking to to serve their customers uh, one of the comments that we heard was that the traffic signal at 16th Street um, is particularly problematic, and that was consistent with our observations, and that's one of the major um, changes with this project is to, to make a, a permissive left turn phase. So right now, um, when 16th Street is running, um, you can't make that left on the Little Harvard, but after this project, we're going to make some changes to the signal to make it possible to make that left uh, before you get to 16th Street. Um, we're introducing some protected intersection elements at 18th and Columbia. That's probably that might be something that only makes sense to the person who com submitted the comment, but it's uh, it was good feedback and it's something that we're incorporating. Um, some of the feedback that we heard um, from the business community was to look at uh, closing Champlain Street for that, you know, short block about 100 feet long between Euclid and Columbia. And, you know, this is a great opportunity to activate it to connect with Unity Park. Um, and that was something that we looked at. And, you know, there's also good safety benefits. And so that aspect of the project is moving forward. Um, on the right, you can see an example of a comparable uh, road closure at 20th Street Northwest uh, in DuPont Circle. 
And then also we're going to be doing um, some planter installations in coordination with the Adams Morgan bid. Um, and one of the one of the big changes that we did with the project um, it was a lot of people said when, when they so we had originally proposed the southwestbound bus lane to Connecticut Avenue as part of this project. I'll actually go ahead to the next slide. Um, and so you can see that in this center photo. Um, we had initially proposed this bus lane on the approach because there had historically been co congestion in that southwestbound direction. Um, we received a lot of feedback that, you know, we haven't seen that congestion here. And um, there's really, um, this will impose a lot of difficulties because there's no alley access and on, on that side of Columbia Road. And so it led us to review all of our traffic analysis to, to go out and update our counts, um, take lots of video, um, update our bus data from WMATA, and um, and then also kind of drill down a little bit deeper, do the survey and see how well the bus lane would actually fit there. And it was clear there were a lot of challenges and the benefits were not as great as, as we had um, estimated based on pre-pandemic planning. And so we made that update to the project and, um, and are able to squeeze in some more parking to, uh, to mitigate those challenges. Um, and so you see the kind of evolution of the alternatives, um, the locations of some of the parking changed, um, the elimination of that southwest bound bus lane. Um, but generally it's it's remained the same. Um, and and now we we are also able to make the protected bike lane go the full length of the corridor. So there have been a lot of good improvements to the project based on community feedback we've gotten. I also wanted to show a little bit of an evolution in how the parking regulations proposed to change. Um, so this orange color, this is the in the center is the initial proposal for parking regulations. And initially we proposed that all through um, the commercial area between Belmont Street and 17th Street, we initially proposed all loading zones um, to ensure that there was was good access for trucks. Um, and other loading demands in the corridor contractors and so forth. And through our engagement with the business community, we got a lot of feedback that we need to have some uh, curbside area for customers and for, um, you know, people that want to make quick visits to our store. And so you can kind of see that what used to be all orange sort of through the core commercial area added a lot more of this blue and that represents metered parking. We also were able to add a handful of zones on the side streets that are circled in blue for, for metered parking. And then those that are circled in green is where we were able to add uh, residential permit parking zones. And so with that, um, I wanna get into the construction schedule. Um, you know, we're very excited. I think that when we initially went out um, back in early 2022, we said that we were targeting um, spring or summer of 2024 for construction. And I think that we're we're on course to to hit that hit that goal or maybe a couple months late. Um, and so and it at the time, people were asking, can you do it sooner? Um, and I think that would have been a real challenge, but I'm excited that we're we're doing it on time and and we're about to get underway. Um, unfortunately, one of the real challenges with this project that I want to lead with is um, there are these streetcar tracks embedded in the asphalt on Columbia Road. Um, you can see an example here in the photo of a of a of a short segment of streetcar track that we extracted from another street. Um, and then you can see this photo of Columbia Road when it was being milled to get resurfaced. And you can kind of see that remnant of a streetcar track that was never extracted from, from the days when they had the streetcar. And so that can really dramatically impact the uh, duration of construction. Um, you know, a platform that would normally take about four days could take eight or 10 days as a result of needing to 
to pull out these streetcar tracks. Um, it's very labor intensive. The good news, though, is that um, Columbia, these have been a problem for Columbia Road. They, they lead to accelerated degradation of the pavement quality. Um, and so Columbia Road, as a result, needs to be resurfaced more often than other roads. And so getting more of these streetcar tracks out of the roadway bed will lead to better pavement condition in the long term. So this is good long term maintenance, long term improvements that need to be made anyway. Um, and so we're targeting to start construction in July. Um, it should be about the second week of July after the 4th of July holiday week. Um, the first step in construction is going to be um, constructing the platforms. Oh, and actually one more thing on the streetcar tracks is that part of the result of that is we're having to split the construction into two phases um, to account for the variability in uh, construction timeline. And we want to make sure that we're able to complete one phase before the winter gets here and and then um, be able to you know have that completely buttoned up and complete um, before cold weather sets in. So phase one is going to be from California Street to 18th Street. There are six boarding platforms on that stretch um, and two pedestrian refuges and each one of those is um, a minimum of four work days, you know, they would normally be about three or four work days each. Um, but depending on how many streetcar tracks we encounter, it could it could double or triple that duration. Um, and so in kind of a worst case scenario, construction might go on until November. Bearing in mind that we'll be working on one platform at a time, so it, it's not going to be like the whole street is under construction for for months. It'll be a couple weeks at a time in each location, so so nobody's going to um, have construction right in front of them for this whole duration. It should be for a relatively short period. And so the first thing is we start with the civil construction, those platforms. And then at the same time, we're also going to go ahead and implement the curbside changes on those side streets. So those areas where uh, metered parking or RPP parking is being added on the side streets. We're going to go ahead and do that um, before construction begins. Um, and then after the civil work is done, we're going to resurface the roadway. And then uh, once that's done and, you know, based on this conservative timeline of um, delays resulting from the streetcar tracks, that should be done in August or September. And then we'll be able to put in the pavement markings, the striping, uh, those vertical elements um, for the protected bike lane, and then do the signs, and then open the bike lanes. And again, that conservative timeline would have us um, complete in November. And because it's starting to get cold at that time of year, we don't want to start work on phase two um, because in cold weather, we cannot put down pavement markings. And so we don't want to start a project, um, start construction if we're not going to be able to finish it in a timely fashion. Um, but if we're able to get through those platforms in a, a more normal amount of time, then we may be able to get through phase two um, before, before winter. And so um, phase two will be next, and that will be the area between 18th Street and 16th Street. There are fewer platforms there. There's only two platforms and one pedestrian refuge. And it'll be a similar progression to the work there, but it should be relatively faster. And um, if if streetcar tracks severely impact the schedule, it might not be until spring 2025 that we're able to complete that work. But again, the the construction duration for phase two should be shorter than phase one. Few more notes on the construction schedule. Um, <clears throat> it'll take place after the AM rush hour and before the PM rush hour on weekdays. Um, weekend work during daytime is also possible. Travel lanes will remain open in both directions, so there, there won't be any detours as a result. One really important thing is to keep an eye out for those emergency no parking signs, which 
uh, are the signs that we use to establish work zones. Um, so when those are posted, we will have the Department of Public Works available to assist with um, ticketing and getting cars out of those uh, work zones so that um, work can proceed. Remember to be cautious and patient in those work zones. Um, you know, it can be difficult visibility for, for everybody. So um, just remember to be cautious and remind others of the same. Um, and DDOT generally, like we work hard to minimize the downtime during construction. You know, that there's that feeling where you go by and it seems like nobody's doing anything. Um, the work zone may appear idle while, um, you know, inspections are happening or traffic signal work is happening. And um, sometimes there's work that's less visible, but it, it's very important and, and it's underway. And um, we are working to, to keep this moving um, as quickly as possible. And I also wanted to note that another major project coming to this area is the, the DuPont deck over and Connecticut Avenue streetscape, which will extend up um, Columbia Road to California Street. So right about where our project ends, um, theirs begins, and we should be completely out of the area by the time they start. Um, but the protected bike lanes that will be part of our project will feed right into the uh, protected bike lanes that are being constructed uh, through their project. And so one final thing <clears throat> I wanted to note is that, um, you know, one of the things that people asked about is what is success for this project? Um, how will you know if it's if it's working. And um, I wanted to note that the bus priority team has been committed to, to doing evaluations of our projects. It was, it was very difficult during COVID because there was just you know, dramatic impacts to travel patterns. And it was hard to know what could be attributed to a project and what could be attributed to um, external factors like the global pandemic. And um, so in the long term, we will be um, doing an analysis to make sure that, um, you know, there, we are seeing the crash reduction that we expect and we are seeing the improvement in bus travel time will be a couple of the really key metrics. One thing to note is that it typically takes about six to 12 months for um, new traffic patterns to completely take hold and to really be evident in the data. Um, and so that's kind of our typical long-term um, analysis that we'll do. In the short term, we are committed to monitoring curbside activity to see if, if there's anything that we can tweak, anything that we can change to make it work better. Um, and, you know, where our, our design team and our, our planning team is uh, committed to, to doing those observations and, and seeing what we can do to make it work better in terms of the curbside regulation and also the traffic operations as well. Um, and that's it for me on the presentation. Um, we do have a, a Title VI survey um, that is optional for meeting participants to fill out. Um, and um, and then I also wanted to share, at, and I'll, I'll switch back to the slide in a moment so that folks can scan the QR code. Um, in this presentation also will be online, but wanted to take a moment to share my contact information. Um, I'm sure there's been some activity in the chat. Um, we should have time for some question and answer. Um, we probably won't be able to get to every question this evening but um, this is my cell phone number, my email address, and I encourage people to reach out with any, any questions you might have. I will be on vacation next week, um, so it might take a little bit of time to respond, but there, are, there is other project staff available to, to respond to any needs. Um, I also wanted to share the contact information for Brittany Adams. Um, she's going to be the construction project manager for this project, and she's going to be on site um, much more often than I am and have direct lines of communication with all the contractors. <clears throat> and so if there is a construction related issue, um, I recommend you reach out to her.
Um, so maybe, I, uh, Jamie, can I ask you um, uh, if, if I haven't been able to monitor the chat, is there any um, questions or anything that we should address at this point? Uh, have we lost Jamie? Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Apologies. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if you heard me ask uh, if there are any questions that I, I'm not. Sh I haven't been able to monitor the chat. So. Um, yeah, I just want. I yeah, I'm doing my best to keep up with these. Um, I think we, um, a lot of the questions. I think are are more, uh, you know, people's, uh, you know, expressing their their opinions, um, and uh, there are a few. Um, I see um, some concerns about not seeing the um, the flyers at bus stops and. You know, this this is unfortunately something that is always a, a, a challenge. Uh, we do our best to try to reach as many people as possible, and um, you know, I think that through all of the the different uh, venues that that Kevin uh, mentioned, um, we we really tried to cover as many as possible. But um, you know, we can certainly we, we can always do better, and I know that uh, we are looking for ways to uh, start doing more uh, potential mailings. Uh, even though that is a pretty uh, costly investment that um, we can't really get for for everything. Um, and as far as uh, kind of general concerns about the uh, uh, traffic and um, uh, parking, and I think all of those details are pretty well covered um, on the materials that uh, we have on the website. Um, let's see. Um, Oh, and one maybe one thing to clarify would be about uh, bus shelters and what the um, uh, process going forward uh, is going to be for evaluating um, the changes there. Yeah, let me switch over to <clears throat> my map of bus stop locations. So. Um, here are mapped out, um, the existing locations of bus shelters, um, where there's a, a digital display shelter, which, um, refers to a bus shelter with next bus arrival information at it. Um, so those are the green dots and then the blue dots are where there's a regular shelter. And so through. Uh, we are going to look to get shelters at as many bus stops as possible, including bus stops that historically have not had bus shelters. Um, and I'm aware that the bus stops at 19th Street currently have benches. Um, and so we are going to try to fit benches and or shelters um, at those stops in the future. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's, it's not noted here that these stops have benches, but we know that they do, and we want to uh, make these bus stops as comfortable um, for people as possible. Um, I think part of that is going to be seeing how much natural shade is present, to what extent the shelter is going to obstruct the sidewalk, and then also some of the kind of complex interactions of having a, a bike lane. Um, or having the bus shelter potentially located between the bike lane and traffic um, to make sure that there's good visibility and that there's not any sort of um, uh, challenges being introduced on the corridor through that. And so, like I said, that, that work is done by a separate contractor and it, it's, um, it's, it's easier to have it done after the construction is complete. And it also will allow us to, to really be on site in the finished condition and um, 
be able to have more control over exactly how the shelters are placed and, and how um, next bus arrival technology is, is placed on the platform and, and things like that. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I guess I uh, see another uh, question I see here is um, uh, from Eileen McCarthy. Uh, when you get create that permissive left turn phase at 16th, will pedestrians get a walk signal before or after drivers get to turn left? If after, how will you ensure that drivers stop turning? So, um the the duration of the uh, pedestrian walk phase won't change as a as a result of this, um, and it will um, improve safety for pedestrians because right now, left turning vehicles have a short window to make that left turn, and it is always in conflict with oncoming traffic from Ontario Road. And providing a larger window in which they can make the left when there's fewer conflicts improves their ability to see pedestrians. Right now, there's just too many things that they're having to watch, and this will really simplify that. Um, and Jamie, I'm I'm not sure I'm not sure if I completely followed. Um, there was sort of a detail of the phasing question that I'm not sure I followed. Um, my. I, the way I'm reading it is that uh, is it if it's is it going to be a uh, uh, like with the the turning traffic like would it be a, a protected permissive um, signal where you might have uh, cars turning across the pedestrian path kind of uh, with thinking there's they still have a protected phase but pedestrians may have started to uh, uh, cross. Um, forgive me if I'm misinterpreting that, um, but I guess to yeah. So, so the permissive phase will be a, a flashing yellow arrow, um, flashing left yellow arrow for cars. Um, so, and it will be concurrent with the pedestrian walk phase. Um, so they will, you know, same as today, they will have to yield to pedestrians. Um, and um, yeah, it, it will not be a, a protected phase. A protected phase for left turning vehicles would take away time from pedestrians to make that crossing and in any way for pedestrians. And you know, Laura, if if you have any, she's the she's the engineer who's who's worked on this design. If you happen to know. Um, or if you can correct me on any of that or provide any clarification, let me know. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, I was reading through, sorry, we cannot answer all the questions like uh, immediately as they type. Six questions. There's, I was reading through some of them and they're asking about bike lanes. Trying to answer those couple of people that were asking, there are five feet uh, to six feet wide. They are on uh, the southbound and northbound um, throughout the corridor, like Kevin was saying. We also have a three feet buffer, and we're protecting them uh, by flex posts and um, a, by cyc uh, like a cycle track. We also have wool stops. There are diverse ways to protect them. Um, people, somebody was asking about like. Uh, if they will be protected for cars or like a uh, people opening the doors and stuff like that. Um, so I think I, I was answering that. Um, there was another question of the bus platforms, um, and how uh, uh, the bikers are gonna see if I can um, find a question by like how that uh, we prevent the bikers to. Um, um, to we prevent the bikers to um to uh, we have uh striping and signs for them to stop for pedestrians on the bus platforms so uh people in wheelchair have access to them yeah i 
even show a picture before. Um, so yeah, they can stop uh, if the bus stop is there and the riders need to access the 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 bus. There's like bikers need to stop for pedestrians. Um, and so yeah, I think there was like questions about the bus platforms and, and um, the bike the bike lanes. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Laura. Yeah, we, we take a number of steps to um, ensure that there is good yield compliance for uh, people on bikes at pedestrian crosswalks on these facilities. Um, there will be pavement marking saying stop for pedestrians, um, signage saying stop for pedestrians. Um, the bike lane will also uh, narrow in some cases. Um, at these sorts of intersections, making it clear that there's there's a need to slow down and and be careful. Um, so yeah, a lot of a lot of design work has gone into these, and and we've we've seen really good success with them around the district. Is there anything else, Jamie? Um, I think that. Uh, some general uh, questions about um, the safety of protected bike lanes, which I think is something that uh, I know we've covered in, in the materials uh, that are online, that these are designs that are informed by the latest in uh, engineering best practices when it comes to the bus stop uh, designs that uh, we realize may be the least familiar aspects of, of that design for some people. That's something that um, we're really a national leader on in terms of the amount of effort that we put into uh, observing and doing outreach and ensuring that um, that we're designing these things to reduce conflict, to slow people down, no matter what uh, their their mode of transportation is, um, and that's something that is a benefit to uh, to everybody. Oh, let's see. Uh, maybe some questions about loading zones in the 1900 and 2000 block of Columbia. Yeah, so on the 1900 and 2000 blocks of Columbia, um, I believe the plan is to, uh, that's one of the, segments of the street that are changing the least in terms of curbside regulations. Um, I think I had a um, exchange with a resident in this area um, uh, and, and offered to um, provide loading zones on the street. And uh, the consensus seemed to be in his building that they would prefer to uh, retain the curbside for uh, residential parking. Um, however, if there is a desire for a commercial loading zone in any location in the future, um, certainly reach out and commercial loading zones, it sounds like it's something that's only for big trucks, but there's actually a lot of flexibility in how those are used. Um, Commercial vehicles um, would include contractors. So if there's, you know, repairman, they're they're able to use that commercial loading zone. Um, and it's also you can do pickup and drop off activity. So kind of like Uber and Lyft, um, they can use it as long as they don't block a uh, commercial vehicle uh, from using it. Um, so it, it's more than just. Um, you know, big trucks and things that can use commercial loading zones. All right, I'm trying to catch up here. Um, Uh, 
uh, some people are interested about when um, the final uh, design plans will, will be available? Yes, so there are some minor revisions that need to be made to the design plans, but I would expect those to be um, posted online in the next week or two. Um, you know, we're we're moving fast on this project, trying to to get it done before cold weather sets in. And um, part of that is going to be um, moving from design into construction very quickly. And, and that's what we're in the process of doing right now. Um, someone asking, could you explain the traffic control changes at 18th? You know, it the the main change there is um it's going the the traffic signal is going to separate um right turning vehicles from the pedestrian and bicycle crossing. So right now right turns happen at the same time as when people are trying to cross Adams Mill on the north side of 18th Street. Um we are going to be modifying that traffic signal so that cars don't make that right turn at the same time that people are crossing the street or that bikes are uh, crossing 18th Street or Adams Mill, it, you know, changes right there, but on the north side. Um, and so that's for um, southwest bound bicycles. Um, we have a question of, uh, can the bus lanes be protected? Often see car drivers weaving in and out of the bus lanes. Yeah, so we, we considered doing, uh, having some form of vertical uh, barrier between the bus lane and the general purpose lanes. Uh, we worked with uh, fire and EMS, um, staff in developing the concepts for this project and they expressed a, a preference to avoid um, those vertical elements in that area to make the bus lane easier for them to use and provide them with more flexibility. Um, they informed us that most of the calls that they respond to are actually east of the station there on Lanier. So, um, uh, this is something that should actually improve their response time and, and we want to be supportive of that and um and in yeah part of part of supporting them is is limiting those vertical elements um and and providing a little bit more flexibility And I think some some people are asking for to explain the design on blocks where there is street parking. Um, and I think this you I think you basically covered this, but um, if 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 you might you mind covering that again. So the design uh, on streets where there's on street parking. I, I guess I'm a kind of the general widths of the lanes and things like that. A little unclear. Yeah. So, um, so what I was, uh, yes. Unfortunately, I don't have the, the a perfect slide for explaining the the widths and everything. I think that um, Laura. Um, covered it a little bit, but essentially the the trade-off in this project is that um, you see in this everything roadway, it shows this buffer with the diagonal lines through it. Um, in order for us to, to fit that into the roadway and to be able to separate bikes from um, the doors of parked cars and moving traffic, um, we can only have parking on one side of the street. So you know, this all adds up to 50 and um, I, I'm, I hope that my, my math is right when I 
go through all the numbers for this, but it's um, an approximately five or six foot bike lane, then an approximately three foot buffer. The parking lane through those commercial areas where there's truck loading and things like that needs to be about nine feet wide. And then the travel lanes are generally 11 feet wide, which is um, the appropriate width for um, a travel lane with buses um, driving through it. And then so on one side of the street, we can fit that parking and on one side we cannot through most of the corridor. Um, <clears throat> And, um, and and that's kind of the typical cross section. And, and we've tried to put the parking on the side of the street where there's more clear demand for parking and loading and also trying to make the, the lane shifts and things through the corridor be, um, be a, appropriate um, to, to moderate um, travel speed and also to, to make the road easily navigated for drivers. And um, I would encourage people to check out on the project website, we did publish a kind of schematic layout of the um, roadway design, and that will show the uh, lane widths and, and how they, they do need to change a little bit throughout the, the course of the project. But um, we are meeting or exceeding um, the the recommended lane widths in our you know all, our design and engineering manual and bicycle facility design guide. So it should be a very good experience for for people driving, biking, walking through the corridor. Um, you know we're we're not trying to cram too much in. Every, everything is at at a preferred width. Uh, there's some questions about loading zones and uh, enforcement of loading zones uh, to ensure that they're available. Yeah, so um, we're working closely with the Department of Public Works to make sure that they have good information on exactly what the zones are going to be when they're in effect. And, um, you know, I've actually reviewed this data on loading zone enforcement and they, they are, you know, actively enforcing those loading zones almost every day of the month. Um, you can, you can get on open data.dc.gov and, and see when they're present and when, or when a citation has been issued and they've got pretty good coverage. And, um, you know, we have monthly calls with them talking about, um, you know, areas where we can improve and in, in making the signage more clear and making sure that everything is enforceable. Um, and we've, you know, presented on on these uh, changes to the roadway and um, and, you know, we have a good understanding and, and we're going to work with them um, during the early stages of the project to to make sure that there's a good um, good effort to enforce and also an effort on, on our part to educate and um, make sure that there's, you know, uh, clear signage um, and that and that people understand what what they're allowed to do where. Great, thank you. And um, one thing that I think we should be uh, Touching on uh, is just to confirm that yes, all uh, the ADA requirements and uh, guidelines and in, um, in the public right of way um, accessibility guidelines uh, that informs all of our um, designs. Yes, uh, most definitely. See, um, yes, 
but to elaborate on that, well, basically the uh, the requirements for a uh, five by eight um, uh, landing platform that because that's incorporated into uh, the the platform that is extending out, um, that's something that is going to it means that then when the bus stops, that required platform that required landing space will be there. Um, and that's something that actually is a lot more reliable with with the bus stop platforms uh, than it is right now, where uh, even though that that ADA landing space is uh, is there on the sidewalk, anytime a car is uh, illegally parked there, the bus can't actually pull over. So that ADA space is not reliably uh, available to people who who need it uh, getting on and off the bus. And so by having the platform there, uh, that incorporates the um, the uh, the landing. And, and yeah, just clarifying, this is not letting wheelchairs off in the middle of the street on um, because the platform is able to come right up to the door of uh, of the bus. Yes. The bus riders have the preference. They are the ones that are going to be unloading and the bikers will stop for them. And um, the bus actually Providing these bus platforms allows the bus to come right and um, and unload them. They have on a space of between five feet in some areas, and then nine feet uh, for uh, bus riders to unload without any traffic and without like taking their time and everything before crossing the bike lane. And they have the preference. They're all on the same level to the same elevation, as you say, so um, they don't have to go up and down. Uh, we're trying to um, give them, but they they have a preference. They don't. Yeah. All right, there was a couple of questions on um, the closure of the block of uh, Champlain. Uh, so maybe if if um, I realize we're over time, but uh, Kevin, if you wouldn't mind uh, just going over some of the uh, the genesis of that proposal and kind of what the um, the plans are for uh, for that space. Yeah, I was going to see if I could find the little picture of Twentieth Street. Um, yeah, so the the genesis of the idea was um, it came up at a, a meeting with a handful of people in the business community, and somebody asked if if something like that could work, and um, and many of the people in attendance thought it was a good idea. So we took a look at it. Um, to see what kind of traffic impacts could happen. Um, one of the goals in MOVE DC, our long range transportation plan is enjoyable spaces. So, you know, not just um, meeting kind of minimum requirements for design of, of public spaces, but actually making them enjoyable and, you know, improving people's quality of life by, um, you know, making it a more making their uh, life in public spaces better. And um, and so we saw this as an opportunity to um, kind of build some better connections between Unity Park and um, uh, the, the surrounding area. And um, this also, this is something that um, 
we're actively coordinating with the Adams Morgan partnership bid on, and there may be some restaurants or other businesses in the future on Champlain Street that um, could potentially apply for a permit to have outdoor seating um, and uh, an outdoor eating opportunities. <clears throat> it could potentially be additional space for the Adams Morgan Farmers Market um, that's already active in um, in Unity Park. So um, it just seems like a, a real win-win. It's also the the northbound left on Champlain onto Columbia Road. It's a very difficult angle with poor visibility, um, and so you know traffic instead will be um, or traffic that is trying to to access Columbia Road can take Ontario instead and there's a traffic signal there and it's it's much easier to make that connection on the Columbia Road okay um, I just want to say that I'm going to just start uh, putting into uh, I'm adding a video from our website. Uh, I forgive me if I'm accidentally not re uh, responding to the correct question, but just because of some additional questions about uh, the bus bike stops, um, the uh, YouTube video that we have uh, that explains a little bit more um, about that. But now I'm not sure where I where I put that. Um, some questions about um, see if I, uh, the design at the south end. Um, I and uh, just saying um, that residents in that immediate area have seen a lot of crazy crash events there, and there was some sort of installation uh, of flex posts for a while, but that's all gone now. Is the basic idea that by constructing Constricting the lane, the lanes only two lanes, that, that will slow the speeding drivers. Yes, yeah, so um, protected bike lanes do have the effect of, of slowing down drivers. That's something that's been seen in installations around the city and around the country. Um, and you know, I I, I can't. Um, comment on the exact status of the flex posts and things that were installed there. I, I know that there was um, some road work done there recently, and so it's possible that not all the flex posts were reinstalled after that. Um, but I mean, yes, the, the idea is that this will um, moderate travel speeds for people driving down the corridor and reduce speeding and make for a, a safer street. Um, when people drive slower, um, they're more likely to yield uh, to pedestrians at crosswalks. And in the event that somebody is hit by a slower moving car, it is uh, becomes dramatically safer at lower speeds or dramatically less likely to result in a fatality. And I think um, just some general questions about people concerned about uh, accessing their their buildings. 
uh, from the street. In terms of, I, I guess saying, yeah, saying street access um, for elderly people um, from from different apartment buildings. Yeah, so I think that um, there are existing challenges for people that are trying to parallel park on Columbia Road right now. Um, parking spaces are not always available at your destination. And in the future, um, it'll be similar today where you need to find uh, the nearest space to access the curb and uh, navigate to your destination on the sidewalk from there. Is there anything else? Excuse me. Is there anything else, uh, Jamie? Well, I know, and I apologize to folks that we weren't able to um, respond to directly. But uh, we do inv invite everyone, um, as far as questions, to clarify the the design. Um, we do have all these details uh, on our website, um, and uh, oh, and actually. We may be about to <laughs> lose our tech support. So, um, um, and so, uh, let's um, maybe if if uh, Kevin, if if you just have our uh, um, uh, our our website, if you could have that up on screen. Um, and so all the uh, the details, uh, whether it's about the specific uh, bus stop uh, locations and design plans, uh, they're all available uh, right there under busprioritydddcgovernor uh, slash pages slash Columbia Road NW. All right, well, um, yeah, and thanks, Jamie, for going through all the comments. I'm sorry I haven't been able to keep up with everything that's going on in the chat. Um, it looks like our our tech support um, for this meeting is going to be wrapping up shortly. We are past time. Um, I hope that this has been informative for everybody. Um, it's um, been a long time coming. We're all very excited about this project. And um, again, um, Jamie shared the uh, the project website. Um, I'm sure at this point, many of you um, have my contact information. Please feel free to reach out. Um, once again, un unfortunately for you, fortunately for me, I will be on vacation next week. Um, but uh, other members of the project team will be here and available to um, 
respond to any concerns. Um, I also definitely encourage people to check out those different resources on the project website. This presentation I will, I will upload to the project website right after this call. And um, then you'll be able to access some of the different hyperlinks that are in the in the presentation itself. Um, thanks again for joining us. I'm I know we're all very busy and um, appreciate everybody who takes the time to engage and express concern about their community. We all we all live here and and we all want to make it a better place to live. Um, so thanks so much for joining and have a good evening.